Hello. My goodness, the last session at the top of the Palais on the last day. It's like the sort of end of the universe. But we're very, very pleased to see you. We were in some doubt as to whether or not anyone was still going to be here. I think everyone who's currently in the Palais is in this room. So that's an, <laughs> that's an achievement in itself. Um, thank you for coming. How many of you uh, were actually paid to come here? <laughs> yes, exactly. By Simon. No. <laughs> So um, our intention is to um, divide our bloggers and tweeters and journalists' reflections on the state of the business as um, of right now into various topic headings so that we just don't get into a kind of soup. Um, and, um, but first, I th I first of all, I think what we'll do is we'll um, introduce ourselves. I am Jess Cleverly. I am moderating. I run a transmedia development company in London. Uh, this is... Uh, I'm Kate Bulkley. I'm a media commentator and journalist. I have an American accent, but I live and work in the UK and have for 20 years. And I cover the business of media, convergence, that kind of stuff. And uh, my name is uh, Simon Staffans. I work as a format developer for uh, cross-media, interactive transmedia formats based in Vaas on the west coast of Finland, where it's going to be sub-zero degrees next week. Mm. So I'm just waiting for some, you know, fiery mountain up in Iceland to do some stuff. Yeah. But you're also a prolific blogger and tweeter. That I am as well. Yeah. James. I'm um, in charge of all social media for uh, for Mip Markets, which means I've been running the live coverage of our, of our show this week on uh, on Mip Blog and just been keeping an eye on what every, everyone's been saying about the show. That's uh, just one of the many things we can talk about today. And, um, you know, the idea of the session is that no one on this panel has a kind of corporate line to tow or a, or, or a boss who's kind of saying, oh, no, I didn't want you to say that. So we're hoping for a reasonably unvarnished uh, view of where we're all at at this point in, in the media's transformation. So the first, the first topic I'd like us to be reflecting on is um, looking out there at the market and indeed at this room and uh, the media year. Who does the panel see as being the kind of coming individuals and the coming companies that feel like they're going to be the biggies of the future, Kate? Well, I think, just to start on that, um, I think we should just take a moment and think about Steve Jobs, because he did leave us last night. And uh, I think that that is quite a significant moment um, for anybody in tech. And certainly, um, I know when I read it, I thought, you know, I know he knew he was sick, but you just, when he actually dies, you think, oh my God. So I think um, certainly of coming things, we'll see what Apple does next. Um, but obviously they've been huge and they continue to be huge. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to say was I think that, and I think it's been a sort of a missing here at uh, MIP, and it always seems to be a missing at MIP, is the whole game side of this. I mean, I think that games consoles um, are really, really important in the whole this connected TV stuff, and um, I think it was just yesterday, uh, Microsoft actually announced a, a like 40 partnerships. So they're really getting into the content game, and they're going to they're going to spit it down into their Xboxes. And I, you know, I think that's a game show. It's going to be Kinect, so it's going to be motion, voice, you know, activated. It's going to have Bing. So I think that's somebody to watch in terms of sort of how this stuff is getting distributed. Um, and I'll say one more thing, and I'll let the other guys um, um, come in. Um, the other thing I think that's big, and it's not really a, a company or an individual actually, but it's kind of a trend, mm -hmm. is kind of the whole dual screen thing. I think that's huge. Um, and if I had to pick one guy who I think's got a really good take on the dual screen, because there's lots of people doing dual screen. Obviously, we heard it from everybody. I mean, everybody from Ann Sweeney was talking about dual screen, obviously from Disney, all the way down the line. But the, the guy who developed iPlayer, and before that um, did Kazaa, whose name is Anthony Rose, who's a technologist, is come out, and he actually was on one of my panels this week, with something called Z-Box, Z-E-E-Box. -E -E -box. And what it is is a dual, dual screen type technology thing where you're the you know the fancy technology that makes it work recognizes what's going on on the television you can use your iPad or your tablet as a remote control you can have social it brings in your Facebook thing it brings in your Twitter you know you can I mean it, you can do all kinds of things. you have transactions there's targeted advertising I just think dual screen is huge and one group to look at is Zbox and other people that are developing cool stuff like that. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll I want to talk a bit about that in a minute, but let's just um let's just Simon, what have you um what have you been seeing in terms yeah. of coming people and companies? Yeah, just briefly about second screen. I conducted a poll on Twitter last night 
which was the most hype bu most hype buzzword of of MIPCOM 2011? Was it A monetization, B second screen, or three social? And was 100% second screen of both the answers I received back. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, yeah, but regarding people, but uh, I think there are more mobiles than there are more mobile screens now in the world, aren't there, than televisions? Isn't that so? Oh yeah, actually, definitely. So we, is the second screen the TV now? Yeah. <laughs> We have well, to change our language. Yeah, yes, right. Uh, first screen. Anyway, right, a yeah. different conversation. Yeah, so ca carry on. So really, really br briefly about uh, people to look out for um, in the coming years or the coming six months or whatever. Uh, as people who have read my blog or anything or anything on Twitter, I'm really big on transmedia. So one person and one company to look at is, is Jeff Gomez over at Starlight Runner Entertainment in New York City. He's He's the one getting a lot of people, including me, uh, to get what Transmedia is about. And they are now moving from blockbuster movies into television as well. And I think that we're going to see some pretty, pretty interesting stuff from them. So take a look at them. Yeah. Are they a technology company or a...? No, content. Content, okay. Um, I'd agree with Simon that the, the Transmedia thing is, is the one to look out for, looking at what we were talking about. This week, this, there's one person I would pick out. It's um, Nuno Bernardo from Be Active Media. Um, they're quite sort of like pi pioneering in transmedia. And the panel that he spoke on at MIP Junior on Saturday mm. was uh, was the most shared live blog post of all our live coverage here this week, which is uh, wasn't even a MIPCOM panel. Um, just shows the sort of uh, thirst there is for to find out more about the topic. Um, he guest blogged for us as well before uh, MIPCOM. His post just did really well, just like Simon's on the same topic. So that's really one to watch. The question is, have the big people got it mm. yet? Mm. Just a quick comment. Uh, Nuno Bernardo, this is, I, I don't have any interest in this, but uh, Nuno Bernardo's got a book out now called The Producer's Guide to Transmedia, mm. which is a really good book mm. because it's really hands-on. It's really, this mm. This is how we did it, and this is how we made money from it, and this is how we did pre-production and production yeah. and blah, 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 everything. So it's um, it's available now too. So, to so, so what strikes me about all your reactions is, is that the coming people, I mean, Nuno, I know a little, and you know he has had to self-finance all his productions. He goes out and he finds the brand partner. He does this, he does that. You know, he's not really walking into television television commissioner's offices at all. Mm. And, um, you know, and obviously you're talking about companies that understand dual screen, and there's Jeff talking about transmedia and, and creating huge brands. I mean, what does, you know, what does that tell us about, you know, the masters of the universe 25, 30 years ago were, you know, either people in big broadcast networks or people sitting inside powerful production companies, none of whom have been mentioned. By e by the three of you now. So what does that tell us about you know if we look at in ten years time who the keynotes are going to be? Well, I mean they're all they're the big guys are playing catch up and they're they're playing catch up for reasons that all of you know because they're trying to basically protect their current revenue streams and their current business models which are imploding around them um, even as they try to you know straddle both worlds the kind of the old world and the new world. Um, so it's not that that's wrong, I mean, but it, it, it can seem sort of short-sighted in the sense that the technology is moving so quickly, right, that they're being overtaken by events. So, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys feel this, but um, one guy I thought was, I thought it was a very interesting session was um, Ted Sardinos, you know, the guy from uh, Netflix, yeah. who was talking to, is it Mike Lee? Mike is it that Mike Lang? Mike Lang, sorry. Miramax. Mike Lang. Mike Lee's the director, sorry. Mike Lang, who's the Miramax guy. Now, that was interesting because Miramax, of course, has been this sort of library that's been kind of, you know, floating around in the ether, not doing anything for a couple of years. And now suddenly, you know, this new, new team is back on it. And what I thought was interesting about what he said about Miramax is he said, you know, we... And they, and they, of course, they have the ability because they, the rights have reverted back to the library, which helps. But, but basically, he's saying we're going to do all kinds of deals. We're going to sell to SVOD. We're going to sell to IPTV. We're going to sell. We're going to do exclusive, non-exclusive. We're open to think about all these different platforms. We're not going to just, you know, stick to one. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that the guys who are going to be the winners in terms of the, the, the next generation, is going to be like the Netflixes and the Facebooks who are thinking about how do we distribute this stuff. But you always have to remember, and I'm sure one of you will say this as well, you know, if there's, if there's nothing to distribute, then, then what do we got? Yep. We got a whole lot of nothing. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was I was coming to the same point that it's it's really hard to wow someone with tech nowadays or software because everyone is really used to the next day is the next next big thing. I just read like 45 minutes ago about these um, contact lenses that uh, uh, project LED light into your eyeball so you can view television via a. Turned out the story was from 2009, so I don't know wha what's happened with that. But still, I mean, that, that would be an achievement. But it's really hard to, because people don't look at tech and say that, oh, it's brilliant, I, I want it because it's tech. It's what can I do with it? H how can I use it for for entertainment, for content creation, for whatever? It's, it's uh, yeah. So I think it's going to go that way. But I mean, so much of it is about, it seems to me, about the confusion about where the value lies. You know, and there's that sort of much told story, isn't there, about, you know, in the gold rush, it wasn't the gold miners who got rich. It was the people selling the pans and the shovels and the tents, right? So, you know, one in a hundred miners hit gold, right? So, it, you know, in a MIP context, all the producers are the miners and, you know, the YouTubes and the and the carriers and, and all the rest of it seem to me to be the p people selling the picks and shovels and the technology companies. You know, so so in this gold rush, you know, the people who are going to be taking the keynotes in 10 years are going to be the rich ones, right? That's basically how it works. They're the rich, powerful people. So do we think those people are going to be the YouTubes, the Netflix? Are they going to be the Miramaxes who own the libraries? Uh, you know, where do you see the value emerging in this market? I, th I think that you have to identify what the goal is first. And I think that's a l what a lot of people are struggling with. Is it the, the, the content that's been going around, or is it something else? Is it, is it the social data? Well. Data is the new all. What is the goal we are looking for? Yeah. yeah. Well, the goal is to make money, right? Yeah. I mean, if the goal is to make money, the guys who are the distributors who can figure out how to monetize this stuff, whether it's advertising or subscription or some combination <laughs> of, yeah. of everything, they're going to be the ones that are going to win, supposedly. I mean, I think, I mean, I would hope that a lot of the people that are in this palais are going to figure out how to not just give their stuff to the Netflixes and the YouTubes of the world, but figure out how to kind of have a little more leverage with these guys to get a little bit more out of them. Now, you know, speaking of Apple again, you know, that's been a pretty tough road to hoe. I mean, look what happened in the music industry. So, you know, you have to be aware that these guys are amazingly powerful. I mean, look what's happened to Facebook just in the past 18 months. It's unbelievable. And of course, now we've got Zuckerberg saying, you know, frictionless sharing, and it all's great, but who's gonna actually pay for the content? You know, who's gonna, you know, is Facebook gonna start co-producing series? I don't know. So, it's difficult. I mean, you know, I think the guys who are gonna be the winners are the guys who have taken the money. And if, the, if that's the dis distribution guys, then, well, we're going to talk about monetization specifically as a heading a bit later. Um, so, transmedia, we've just talked about, you know, the, the, what was the buzzword, you know, and the buzzword was dual screen and, you know, your your man of the future is indeed Jeff Gomez and all the rest of it. So, I d I, do we think, I mean, in tr last year was about transmedia. I've, you know, been flown around the world to hypothesize on the <laughs> subject. Um, fascinating it was too, I can tell you for everyone who was there. Uh, but... Um, is transmedia, do we think, the, you know, this year's word, or is it a new reality that we're entering into? What, what's your feeling about this, James? Because you, you were I talking about this. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's uh, a buzzword at all. It, what, what does seem to happen is that similar things get given different buzzwords every year. <laughs> yeah. But um, the, f the, the most important thing is, un is for everyone to understand what what transmedia is and what we're trying to get at. We just um, Frank Boyd, who's, who's over there at, at the back, just did um, a great white paper for us, which was about um, multi-platform commissioning for Channel Four. And there was debate at uh, at MIPCOM HQ as to, is this is this transmedia or is this multi-platform? It's not. It, transmedia is when you develop something from the outset for for several different platforms. And the, and the stories of the different platforms crisscross. It's not with what this um, white paper was about, which is how do you decline a show online? So first, we need to agree what it is, and I think I think we're getting there. And then the next thing, and it was why this is why this panel was so important, is understand how we can use it to capture teenagers' attention, which is just completely dispersed. So if we're talking to teenagers on wherever they are, surely that's the way forward. My favorite quote out of that panel, it wasn't a quote, it was a, sh it was a slide that Nuno Bernardo showed, which was a teenager saying, um, 
TV, it's like the internet, but not as good, or, <laughs> or something like that. Um, and, and, that, and that provoked <laughs> lots of sort of um, quite... Um, some people got quite angry about that on Twitter, including Claire Tavernier from Fremantle yeah. Media. Um, that, and she said, that's like saying books are not as good as, as TV or something, whatever. But the point is... Um, that was his perception. Yeah. yeah. That, that, was that teenager's perception. perception was yeah. that. And so that's, that's what the, the future masters of the cool. universe have got to be playing... Uh, Four. Yeah, I mean, I came. I, I have a large TV with a very reflective screen that always has hand marks on it, and I spend my time anally polishing the hand marks off my TV and wondering who puts them on there. And then, of course, I found my six-year-old trying to move stuff around on the screen, and you know, sort of said, "What are you doing?" She said, "Dad, why is the TV bust?" And I was like, "Great, there's a title for the talk." Mm. Um, but you know, her she has had far more experience on my iPad and my wife's iPhone and all the rest of it than she has with television. And as a result, her expectation is that the screen will respond. You know, I, I mean, I think that transmedia and multi-platform. I think I think you make some good points that they are different things. And most of the big guys are still talking about multi-platform, yeah. and they're still talking about okay, we make a show. Um, and maybe we get the internet guys in at the beginning of the show and we talk about what we're going to do online and we talk about the Facebook integration and we talk about the Twitter doodly and whatever it is. But that's still multi-platform and that still has a largely promotional element to it. Okay, Transmedia is something really, really different. Now, who are going to be the guys that really come out with the cool transmedia stuff? You know, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that I did this week, which was this um, at, at this MIPCOM, which was fun, was I got to interview Tim Kring and Kiefer Sutherland and Kevin Riley. Okay, and now Kiefer is obviously the star of this new thing called Touch. Tim Kring was a writer of Heroes, and now he's written Touch. And Kevin is obviously the head of uh, president of Fox Entertainment. Yeah. Okay. So they're this is you know they were all together. And what was interesting about it is Tim, you know, on Heroes was big into extending the franchise online, you know, doing fanzine stuff, web all that kind of stuff. Kiefer, um, if you didn't hear the session, has also done some stuff online. He just did something called, I think it's called The Confession, which was an online webisode type thing. So he's really into it too. So there they are on stage, and those two start talking, noodling around about, you know, you know, what they want to do with Touch, this new show. And they start saying, you know, what we'd really like to do is have all this stuff happen simultaneously, like, you know, so people could chat and talk about the show. And we want to release the show simultaneously worldwide. And I could just see Kevin going, oh, my God. <laughs> so I said, Kevin, so what do you think? Worldwide, you know, day distribution, day. day and date of Touch? And he goes, oh, I wouldn't want to commit to that. And I'm thinking, okay, well, there's a big problem. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? So... Anyway, that's my little. The, so that was a great theme of the of the week was the, the the conflict between the stated intentions and and what you're actually what they're actually doing. And then there's a, another great um, sort of irony that we picked up with Angela and Stuart add to live bloggers was that okay, everyone's saying you've got to develop for lots of platforms at once from the outset. Look at Breaking Bad. Look at uh, look at Mad Men. Look at all those fantastic shows um they're not transmedia at all right. they're just they're just tv right. shows and they they build a huge buzz online but i mean yeah. so so, so do you have to be transmedia yeah. you don't necessarily yeah. yeah i would say there's absolutely no need for for any content to go transmedia it's when it makes sense to uh, use mm. transmedia right. methods i mean I, I, you yeah. know i think that mad men is transmedia because there are loads of people tweeting as characters from yes. Mad Men who are yes. nothing to do with the show, that AMC and Matthew, what's his name, had to have a whole kind of, oh God, do I mind that there's some woman who works in marketing tweeting as Betty? Yeah, yeah but and it wasn't <laughs> conceived as such. That's the no, sure, but yeah. I mean, the truth is that, you know, what all that means is, is that Mad Men is a transmedia brand, but the audience did it, and the network yeah. were left watching, you know. Mm -hmm. And and this is, you know, what someone w on a panel I was on this morning was sort of saying that, you know, 60% of all people watching TV in North America are doing something else media-related at the same time that they're watching TV. So your only choice now is, do you provide them with the thing that they're doing while they watch your show, or uh, or does someone else, you know? So that's a, that's a, you know, that's a huge, that's a huge thing. But I mean, I, th I think that, the point remains is that, you know, certainly as a producer, when you get asked to produce a transmedia project, you just think, 
well, where's the money coming? You know, wh where's the money going to come from? And how do I monetize my transmedia extension? Which is why, up until now, and certainly all the things that Jeff's done have essentially been yes, fantastic, interesting transmedia projects, but they've basically been marketing for tentpole movies, right? So, so do we think you know it can't be that transmedia is here to stay as a marketing device, or, or is that the future of transmedia? Do you think? I'm not going to answer precisely that question. Go on, that answer that question, <laughs> Simon. <laughs> I'm just going to quote from from like a transmedia developer's point of view. Michelle Railhack from uh, from Arte had a really good quote about transmedia, like most other types of startups and stuff like that. You st it goes in three stages. You start off in the rebel stage, which is a beautiful stage to be in because it's you against the rest of the world, and you're like working till four in the morning, you go out drinking, you go at nine nine o'clock in the morning, you go back to work because it's so much fun. Yeah, that's where transmedia has been, and slowly moving into the second phase, the the pioneering stage, mm -hmm. where it's be becoming more accepted by the industry. Mm -hmm. You see the first examples of something that actually works, and we're not we're not there yet at the third stage, the monetization monetization stage where we have accepted business models and where everyone can see that, okay, we're going to go down that route with yeah. this particular project. So we're heading there, but it's going to take some time. And we're still at that sort of risk-taking stage, and the people that take the risks and, and, and win will be the ones that will, will obviously take some of that money. Well. But I, I think the monetization thing is a good point. I don't <coughs> know if you want to bring that yeah, in. Let's l I mean, you know, yeah. as they say, this l our industry is full of people trying to be the first person to do something for the second time, right? So <laughs> some, someone, needs to do some, someone needs to do it for the first, the time, first time, and then the transmedia gate will open, and yeah. you know, we'll be off to the races. OK, so um, in a radical departure from my own agenda, let's talk about money then. Let's talk about some financial models here. And you know, what, what do we think? You know, OK, there's the old system, which was license fees paid by broadcasters directly to producers to produce programs. Advertisers pay money to channels. Hey, presto, a simple and beautiful world in hindsight. Yeah. Moving forward, what what financial models are w are you guys seeing that you think genuinely start? You know, someone said to me, "God, we're swapping TV dollars for internet dimes here." Is that the future, or or are we going to see financial models that actually do, in some way, get us back to where we were when at the height of the advertising, you know, Eden? Um, Anne Sweeney got up on stage and gave a speech. You know, she's the ABC um, Disney person. And she said, oh, you know, that whole um, di digital dimes, uh, analog dollar, she said that was way overplayed and, you know, it was a short-term thinking type thing. And I thought, wow, gee. And then I thought, okay, well, what has ABC Disney done in this space? And, of course, they were the people that, that glommed on to iTunes, remember, fastest and uh, are still in on that and are, you know, using that as their kind of monetization thing. But, you know, they're not getting that much out of that. I mean, it's that, what is it, the 60-30 thing? So, or, or is it 70? I can't remember. What it, but, I mean, in other words, they get less. And it's sort of like, okay, well, they're, okay, that's one thing, yes, but what else? And how are you actually going to get the kind of money that you've been getting out of those broadcasters or out of those, you know, free-to-air commercial advertisers um, all these years? One of the things I'd like to say about monetization is, in the financial models is the thing that I was hearing a lot from at this the last week was um, technologies that monitor what's on the screens better and data collection and what we do with all that as part of this how the heck do we monetize this stuff. Because, you know, in the old days when we had the, the windows were pretty clear and you only sold stuff for certain windows and then your window ended and then it went to the next window and blah, blah, blah. That, the windows as we know are collapsing, they're starting to overlap, and so you have to really take care of what's going out where and when. <laughs> you know, <laughs> worldwide, day and day. You yeah, know. and so there's, there are companies out there, and I met a lot of them this week, who are monitoring stuff, monitoring technologies, there are people that are collecting data, figuring out what to do with it. I mean, in, in the UK, Channel 4 has got a whole division now that's all about how do we collect data off of you know, the 4ODs type stuff to figure this out. So I think that's important, and then I'll, I'll shut up, I'll say one more thing, is I think SVOD is really important, and I think that for a long time, we sort of thought, oh, it's all about ad bot, it's all about advertising supported bot. I think that at this market, what I'm hearing is that people are like, okay, ad bot doesn't really get us there. We've got to get SVOD to work. And Meaning? Meaning subscription VOD. Yeah. And, the, and the thing that's really put the fear of God in those people in the Palais and got them moving in the right direction on SVOD is Netflix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, you know, it works, okay? And we can talk about their share price and everything else, but I mean, basically it works. And so people are like, oh, hey man, people will pay a subscription 
for something. So I think that's one of the monetization things. But so don't don't people get even less? Don't producers get even less money from Netflix than they do from iTunes? This is this again. This is well, they put money into programming, and of course they say they're starting. Right? Remember, Ted said you know they did the House of Cards thing, and now they're doing. Is it Lily Harmer? They bought yeah. the exclusive rights to the, the Stevie Van Zandt thing, and then they also were doing something else. What was the other thing? Oh, Borgia. That's right. They brought the exclusive rights to the Borgias for the U.S. So yeah, they're putting a little bit more money into programming, but not sort of, you know. Not at the level that we need. But I mean, if you put that next to HBO, which is a subscription-driven business, where when you go into HBO, I mean, I had a meeting with HBO executives, and I said, so, you know, how, to, how much are your budgets? And he was like, you know, I mean, this was a long time ago, and he should remain named. He goes, oh, we don't have budgets. We just keep shooting till it's right. <laughs> They're like, you know, because they've just got so much money, right? And they put it into production, and, they've, and that drives their subscription business. So that's just a very different, right, than Netflix putting in a few... Or even a hundred thousands of dollars, but you know we're talking about HBO spending two, three million dollars an episode. Yeah, but we're talking about little bits of revenue. I think that's the future: is little bits of revenue coming from little lots of places, as opposed to here's your one lump check, Warner Brothers, from you know Broadcaster X. Yeah, and I think that um, one's going to bang on the transmedia drum a little bit. If bang I bang on, bang on. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that transmedia methods and transmedia storytelling can help in that sense because I think we're going to see less and less ad prices being calculated by how many people viewed a certain television show, more performance-based yeah. calculations of how a yeah, television a show is data. doing. Yeah. yeah, and how how much do people connect with it on Facebook? How much do people upload fan fiction on YouTube, etc.? All these things, even though you haven't commissioned them and not paid a cent for it, but you have made the po like with the Mad Men Twitter accounts who have thousands and tens of thousands of followers, they add value to your brand that you can then bring to sponsors, etc., etc. Yeah, and you've so got to yeah. track that so you can prove to these advertisers yeah, exactly. that you know they're actually going to get something out of it, which is why I think we need to update all of our monitoring and data co well collection. I mean, in, in a former life, I used to do publicity for theatres, and if you wanted the director to stay out of your office and complain about how shit the marketing was on the show, <laughs> you would put a post, you find out where he was staying and put a poster <laughs> up opposite his house. And he would be in your office the next day going, you've done such a great job on this. Oh if you told him that you'd sent out 10,000 direct mail letters to people you knew were interested in his work, he'd just sort of glaze over. Because in the end, you know, he's an e or she is an egotist like everyone else. And you see that all the time in advertising agencies. You know, I don't care if it doesn't deliver. I want a TV spot, you yeah, know, because it's sort of how everybody's sort of... You know, it's an ego thing, and it makes me feel real, and my friends get to see it, and the lot. I don't want some funny little digital direct mail campaign that might work, but how does that make me look good? So, you know, how do we, as you say, I mean, data is a massive, massive, you know, is the gold mine, but it's then a question, isn't it, about what do you do with that data, and how do you pe get people to go shopping? I mean, that's the yeah. bottom line here, isn't it? There's also a really important point about this, its data and its and its bandwidth. I was having a really interesting discussion at our uh, tweet up the other day with a guy from uh, Kidobi um, in Canada, which mm -hmm. is a, a startup for kids content, and um, he was saying, yeah, that the, the Netflix now represents something like 22% of all bandwidth in in the U.S. for everything, mm -hmm. which is just which is just incredible. So that's going to be capped at some point. And um, so the, there's only so much you can watch Netflix before the, before the pipes just uh, are too small, it's just in purely technical terms. So he said what they do in Canada with Rogers, their operator, their operator says, if you want to watch movies on Netflix, it's capped. So you can go above, you can't go above a certain limit. If you watch our VOD service, you can watch it as much as you like. Mm -hmm. So. Talking about monetization and who's in control and everything, what if it's the operators? What if it's the... The, 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 the pipe owners, you mean? The yeah. pipe owners, because mm -hmm. look at that muscle they can mm -hmm. oh, flex they have huge with, muscle. with content. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. It's a, it's a big problem. I mean, you know, the thing about ISPs and, and telcos and stuff is that you know, they've been trying to figure out a way to get into this space for years, right, with IPTV and stuff like that. And what they're realizing now is that their biggest, their biggest hammer is their pipe. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's sort of like you know, yeah. Oh, well, you know, we want to traffic shape you. You know, we want to we want to give you a limit or a cap on all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's it's a big problem. On the other hand, you know, the content guys will say, look, if you don't deliver, you know, you want to deliver this stuff because then we can earn more money, all of us. So I mean, you know, up your up your capacity, boys. Uh, there was uh, an interesting talk on IBC last month 
where it turned out that uh, the internet companies who were going to be the bane of, of television are actually buying a lot of ad space on TV, mm. in, especially in Germany, w w which was the example in the, in the talk that I was, I was listening to. But they bought like for millions and millions and millions of euros ad space to get eyeballs onto what property they had and get people to on their internet portals. And, and do you think that sort of, you know, disintermediated relationships between p producers and consumers are going to be, I mean, are we, you know, I, I paid, happily pay 15 pounds for a box set, you know, am I going to be paying a dollar an episode directly to the makers of a Mad Men, you know? Is my f is my favorite? Is Tim Kring going to be saying to his community, guys, I want you to crowd fund my next project because that way I can really make it how I want to make it, and we don't have to deal with the you know the the, the, the influence of the conservative influence of the network, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do we sort of see that kind of almost direct patronage relationship starting between key creative people and communities wanting them to to work? I think I think we'll see some of that, but it'll have to be people with a pretty big clout to yeah. start with. If you see what I mean? Because you know the Kiefer Sullivans can do it. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, he was sort of saying because uh, he's also executive producer on Touch, and his view is sort of you know it's kind of nice to because you know as a as an actor I see that you know it's getting into the production side. You know I like working on the net because it's very interesting to see how we can build an audience mm. and how that looks. Mm. And you know that somebody like that can go direct because people know who the heck he is. Mm. It's sort of like when the music business started doing this. It's like, you know, if you're not already established, can you make it work? Well, the Arctic Monkeys worked. You know, they just had, they didn't have a record company. They just went out on the internet. But how many people can actually make it work like that? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I guess it's different. They're different mediators as opposed to just being the Warner Brothers or the, the Foxes. It, it may be some of this, some of this stuff. But people always sort of say, oh, you know, that person is, you know, the, the X million views on YouTube. And unless you're in that world, you've never heard of any of them, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. uh, that's th which is fine because it's just a direct relationship. It happens sort of under the, under the right. sort of big broadcast radar. Right. Um, and, um, you know, I wonder how many of your average Italians have heard of, had heard of Leonardo da Vinci when he was being patronized and painting. You know, so, yeah. so, so are we entering, do you think, a world where there are sort of I mean, someone was sort of saying that one of the big dangers is information bubbles. So if you get all your information on the internet, let's say you know you are a you know member of a, I don't know, let's say you're a fundamentalist of some sort living you know in the Midwest of America, you know, and you get all your information via your private news networks and your information networks, would well, you just basically start to develop a version of reality which is potentially at vast variance to the guy living next to you who's in a different information bubble? Right. I mean, do we think that this is a world of ever more kind of sealed niches yeah, niches of niches yeah yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's scary isn't it <laughs> it, is, it is scary and it, I mean, we would, we've been talking about that this week it's it's all great to talk about two screen and etc but two screen only works for event tv like sport or x factor if everyone is off in their own corner watching whatever they want whenever they want then there's no there's no potential for for discussing that with your with your friends unless they see on Facebook that you're watching it whatever, um, it's limited, isn't it? Um, but then I don't think we'll ever give up on the the whole th th that really unique thing that TV has. It's it's something you can talk about with your friends, and so that's why th I don't think event TV and will will ever go away. Can I just add something else about financing? Because we started out yeah, talking yeah, about financing, yes. and and you know, obviously in this in the Palais in the last you know I don't know several years, you know, it's all been about co-financing, right? And the fact that you know you can't, as you said at, at the beginning, you know you can't get all the money from the broadcaster, you can't get all the money in one go anymore. You have to kind of Patch find you know patchwork, patchwork it yeah, together, yeah. right? And certainly that we've seen a lot of that. And one of the things that that I'm still seeing is you know how can we be innovative about raising money and we in this week we had a couple things that were interesting we have you sort of the advertisers trying to get into it i still don't think we're do doing enough with that i think that you, we've got to remember the brands have a tons of money and they're very eager to get to people we just have to figure out a way to make it so it doesn't all become advertorial and that of course is the big issue but there's a lot of money swishing out there in the you know whoever it is dupont nike you know png Unilever, and all those guys i mean they've got 
they've got buckets of cash, and they want to make it work. And sometimes when you see something good happen, like I'm thinking, this is actually something that ca came out at NAPI. I'm supposed to, not supposed to mention NAPI. I mean, anyway, American Express did a, um, a thing. Some of you may have seen it if you're based in the U.S., but um, it was with Jay Leno, you know, who's the, the, the late-night talk show host. And he basically, it was, a, it was a, quote, an ad. It was a piece of content that d they delivered on the Internet. And Jay Leno basically went on this journey, and you saw him in India, and he was person a cotton field and then he was at a, a textile weaving factory and then he was at a place where they were dyeing things and they were putting red ink on this fact this fa fabric that he had woven anyway this whole story emerges and of course basically the, the at the end he's standing right behind the curtains before he goes out on his live show and of course there are these beautiful red curtains that he's had made in this story and of course it's American Express makes it happen because of course he's in India and of course he's paid for everything on his American Express card now the content was actually quite nice American Express loved it because it was all their brand values you know cool people traveling using our card you know is that the future for television and film yeah there's a lot of money there, but we've got to figure out how to make it work so it doesn't just become extended advertising. And there's that car company, didn't it, that did the hire where Clive Owen was a driver driving, I think, a, I oh think yeah. a high-end BM, I think, yeah. Yeah. and then he picked up different people. And then one, he picked up Madonna, and she was a pain in the ass and, you know, as a celebrity, and then he picked up someone else, and then he picked up someone else, and really serious people did it. I think John Woo did one, and t I think, I'm not sure if Tarantino did one, but it was very much up at that level, you know. But when you watch them, they're just really great short films with Clive Owen as the central right. character who just happens to be riding a driving a really, really nice car, you know. So how do we make that work with something as, you know, wonderful as, I don't know, if, if, if it's wonderful, but something like the Borges or the Tudors yeah. or yeah. something like that, which is a you know a big piece, yeah. how do you make how do you somehow get the brands involved and yet don't let them screw up the creative? Well, it's it's not necessarily about films, but um, one of the best examples of branded content around TV I saw was an a, another non event. It was at Cannes Lions this June. Um, the one of the prizes was won by an agency called AKQA who made a. A dual screen app for watching football with, um, so you're watching the uh, the UEFA Cup with your with your iPhone, and they take a corner, and you bet on will the corner become a goal, and if the corner becomes a goal, you win points. And it was a really clever. Um, they had to synchronize the app with the TV feed to make sure that it was all working together. Um, and the, 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 the technically speaking, the work they did for that was amazing. And it was just branded Heineken. Um, and that was it. They weren't, they weren't influencing right. the, the content that people were watching, but they were really sucking people into, yeah. into the game and, That's good. and bringing this added yeah. extra. Mm -hmm. um, that's the sort of thing we should be seeing more. I, I mean, I guess the truth is that the only reason content exists on TV is people won't watch adverts 24 hours a day. Uh, content doesn't yeah. exist because corporations right. love people like you and I making TV shows. It exists because the people just literally can't stomach too much advertising. Right. So that's not <laughs> going to change. But if the content delivery system is shifting away from television, the brands still understand that a cold brand message is an essentially empty and undigestible thing so you know maybe that maybe that is a way forward you know what I mean you you're sitting in a format development company so I mean are you are you pitching to brands now yeah the thing thing with uh, if you talk about multi-platform you talk about uh, transmedia and I talk about television going more and more social it's that you find that there are not that many brands who are prepared to be that in that sort of tight relationship mm. with a consumer that they have had a traditional relationship mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. It's a big step to go down on a level and become friends mm -hmm. with the people you are trying to <laughs> sell stuff to. Sure. And if you uh, muck it up, they're going to be the friends that called you six months ago and you didn't call them back. Yeah. And you, you just... Like, oh, I'd, I hope they don't call me up again because I have such a bad conscience because I didn't call them back, and it's all going to be pain. It's funny because so some brands, you're right, you're absolutely right. Um, some brands have embraced it, and some brands are scared to death. Um, I'm tr the one I'm thinking of that leaps to mind is Ford. I mean, Ford's been doing social media for, I think, I don't know, since 2008 or something. I mean, they've got, and they've got a guy who has a title, like head of social media. His name is Scott Monty. I know that because I interviewed him once. But anyway, he, he, he's like, you know, we've got to make a, a direct you know, establish a direct rapport with our consumers, even though, you know, warts and all, they may come back and say, we really hate this car, you know. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I went to a, another non-MIP event uh, at MIT, which was when they opened the Center for the Future of Storytelling. Now, why have they entered the center? Why, you know, the only way those guys get to open a new center is because there's enough corporations who are prepared to sponsor it, right? So if they're able to open a new center called the Center for the Future of Storytelling, you know there are enough rich corporations who are worried enough about having lost control of the story, right? The story used to be controllable. Mm -hmm. you, know, you probably owned the media organization. You owned the mean, you know, you owned it. So the story was was controllable. So this is really about transparency, isn't it? And about having lost control of the lost control of the channel, you know. And one of the one of the case studies they had there was Domino's Pizza and the campaign that they ran in the States. Domino's was not popular, the sales were declining, the product was not popular. And they did this, they sort of said, okay, let's embrace transparency. You know, and the first advert they did was, hey guys, you've told us that, you know, you've told us our product sucks, we know it. You know, we know it tastes bad. They even had people kind of on TV <laughs> saying, oh, it tastes like a bit of cardboard, it's not good, you know, at, in their houses and stuff. And then, you know, they sort of went away and, you know, if you can imagine a few nervous nervous people around the boardroom at um, Domino's and you know, then they, you know, they, they, they changed the whole thing and they did a whole bunch of social media outreach, changed the recipe, went back for the next round of adverts on TV to the same people with the new recipe that they'd created as a result of the feedback they got on social media. You know, and there's this amazing picture they showed of a mom and pop shop, a Domino's shop where they had their sort of sales chart and it was like in the back room of the pizza shop. So it was a sort of, you know, shitty room with sort of files overflowing and stuff. You know, they had it, all the sales curve like bumping along, bumping along, bumping along. And then the sales curve starts going up and it goes up and it goes up and the, and the line goes up onto the ceiling of their yeah. thing and kind of carries on. And it's, yeah. you know, and the guy was there from Domino's saying, you know, you don't have a choice about transparency. So, you know, again, it's this thing of, you I know, they're going to be doing two things while they're watching on TV. Yeah. The only question is, are you going to be the thing that they're doing, yeah. you know? I think it depends what you're talking about, too. It works with pizza. Does it really work with... I mean, I remember Steve Jobs, speaking of Steve Jobs, saying, you know, he didn't believe in focus groups. He said sometimes people don't know what they want until they see it, you know, because he had a vision for blah, blah, blah. And, of course, you know, we love his products. We love his products. So, uh, you know, if you, if you go to the, lo you know, the democracy and say we're only going to produce TV programs that the, ho the whole social media sphere thinks, yeah, that's great. You know, will we get mm -hmm. a good TV program? Yeah. See, that's, that's, that's where, I, where I fall off of that. I think it works with certain things like food, stuff like that. I'm not sure it works necessarily in the creative business. I still think we need to somehow find a way to champion creative sparks, who are like the Tim Krings or whoever they are. We're going to come up with these fantastic things that none of us ever thought maybe yeah. would be cool. Well, yes, I mean, the first person to do something for the second time is like, okay, well, who's going to be the first person to do it for the first time, right? So An Angela's bursting to ask a question. Transparency is one of those really difficult things because it's one of those things that's preached both on the ad side and on the media side. And the problem with transparency is it's very broad but also very vague. The, the question behind the transparency is this is, what, this is one of those things we're preaching to companies now. You have to be transparent. And behind this question is... Uh, this idea that businesses have to behave more as if we're human, more as if we're forming human relationships. The issue with transparency is humans aren't fully transparent with each other either. There are things that you can reveal to your mother or well, to a group of You are if you're uh, 10, if you're on Facebook, they seem to be revealing everything. It's just Well, that's an etiquette it's just problem older that's people. going to change with time. But how are businesses, how should businesses address the transparency issue in a practical sense bearing in mind that they cannot be 100% transparent for reasons of uh, investment, for mm. reasons of uh, just because there are some things that they can't say. They well, know they, that can't they can't say it. They just have to figure out what their level of transparency is, I think. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't think that's, I don't actually think it's as big a problem as you think. I think that a company is pretty clear about what they can and cannot say. You know, if you're publicly listed, you can say some things and you can't say other things. You know, there's, you're not going to go into the dirty washing about all of your business models in public. It just doesn't work. But so many of them make this mistake of joining Facebook and saying, okay, now we're going to be transparent, we're going to talk. When people see a business on Facebook, they have this expectation that all of a sudden the business becomes more accessible. And they're well, going to be honest Well, it does become more successful. It doesn't mean you're going to know everything. Not successful, everything. but accessible. Accessible. So when you take it does become more accessible, but it's not going to become completely accessible. Naturally. Mm. But when you take issues with them and their ethical, pr ethical practices, for example, uh, the Nestle Kit Kat issue that Greenpeace sort of unaired, mm. businesses have a huge issue because all of a sudden they need to address people on that level, but they also have a, a business interest to protect. Can I comment? Yeah. yeah. I, I, think, I think a level of 
honesty is is sort of like the key to it all because what what you need to do is is basically tell people if i can't tell this as a company i, I won't tell it I won't tell and it. just b be completely honest about this because people understand that you're a company of course you can't reveal everything but i will agree to this that as tv becomes more social as everyone is agreeing on we're going to see the same mistakes social media mistakes that we've seen in ad in the ad world these horrible cringy things that mm -hmm. just Makes you really happy that you were not involved. <laughs> and if someone here was involved, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this really like, oh my God, you couldn't do like that. Uh. <laughs> so we're going to see that in television as well. But uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's exactly, human. It's exactly that. This another re recurring question we've been asking ourselves this week is, is, is TV, uh, are TV companies transparent enough? Are they social enough with all the talk about we've got to, we're doing this on Facebook, it's great, we're doing this on Twitter, it's great. One thing I noticed this week, which I can believe, is um, Fremantle Media's uh, Twitter handle, at Fremantle Media, 400 followers, no tweets. Right. Well, why? I mean, they're, they're, we love them, they're great, they're a really important client, of course, but they... Maybe and they do a lot of talking in the name of their show brands, of course. That's what they should stick to. Th that's what they, they should that's just what, kill that. What they should that stick is, to. But there's, media. of course, you can't cover all bases. And Claire Tavernier was saying we'll only do social if it's relevant for a certain show. But um, there was a great moment at the start of the t the social TV panel the other day where the moderator uh, checked the on stage checked the social media profiles of the of the speakers. And he found that it was Claire Tavani who was the most active on Twitter, but the others. Yeah. So when we talk about social embracing social media, is is the TV business really doing it, or is it letting agencies do it, which is not well really but the same? But thing. I mean, you know, back to this issue of monetization. You know, three hundred thousand viewers on TV a problem. Three hundred thousand followers on Facebook business. Mm. Now, what's the difference between those two? You know, the same number of people. I would say the difference is service, right? So one group are getting serviced and reflected and responded to and treated in a certain way, and the other are not. Mm. And as a result, the return that you get from 300,000 viewers on television is microscopic compared to the potential return you get from 300,000 dedicated followers on Facebook, you know, which would be a very good living, you know, Now, if we just convince the ad agencies of that, that would be good, and they'd make the CPMs go up and the, yeah. There's a, there's a gentleman over here with a... Uh, hi, my name's Chris Noble. I'm from a company called World Nomads. Um, I'll tell you a very quick little story. About four years ago, uh, we created a travel philanthropy program off the back of our website. Now, we sell travel insurance. So you're probably wondering why I'm a travel insurance company at MIPCOM. We created a travel philanthropy, pro uh, philanthropy program off the back of that one of the projects we thought would make a good documentary. Mm -hmm. I sent a mate with a camera up to Nepal. He shot it. I thought if it's crap, we'll stick it on YouTube. If it's half decent, I might use my wife, at, uh, who had relationships with InFlight at the time, to try and get it on airlines as branded content, uh -huh. license-free content, and then we'll see where it goes. Got onto a couple of airlines, distributed it, picked it up, saw it, brought it to MIPCOM four years ago, three years ago, and sold it. So we ended up shooting an entire series off the back. So when you ask the question of can you be transparent, can you be an organisation that's created content Yes, you can. Can you create branded content? Yes, you can. Is it in, uh, in you know, enjoyable content? Well, that Geo bought it, mm. so it can't have been that horrendous. Mm. Um, so yeah, there is an opportunity to be able to do it, and I think for as a, as a brand, not as a not as a studio, there is an opportunity to be able to involve in these projects. You've got Red Bull Media downstairs. Oh yeah, no, creating, I think there are creating definitely fan, you know, fantastic content. Um, but from a brand perspective, for us. It's about wrapping, it's about using that medium as a way in which that we can tell our story, mm -hmm. you know, without us selling. Um, mm -hmm. And if, we, if you're a company that's also heavily engaged or uh, on social media, it just becomes an extension of what you do. Yeah. So, yes, and it is possible. What kind of budgets are you willing to put into that kind of programming? Depends on the size of the project and what it was. I mean, we started off like most organisations, pretty sort of light. We might have invested 20 grand in the first documentary, and then after that, it's probably 30 grand a pop. So for half an hour of TV, that's, I don't know, it's probably reasonable. Um, and that, that's what we did. Now, you know, the deal with Nat Geo didn't necessarily, you know, probably pay for 80% of the, the production cost, but at the end of the day, my brand's on 26 airlines around the world that's on National Geographic Adventure, so, so would I sooner spend $80,000 on doing something like that that's going to tell the story of my brand, or do I want to go and spend the same amount on an on a ad, you know, advertisement over a highway somewhere? Mm. Well, I mean, I think we could talk about the sorts of companies that are going to 
flourish or disappear in a kind of transparent age, is, but it, it feels like a slightly different subject to me. So I'm going to move on. Um, okay, so d we have 10 more minutes. So I'd like to um, just sort of talk a bit about, you know, the deals you've seen being done in the last sort of few days, not necessarily the big flashy ones, but all the, all the noisiest or the highest value ones. But wh what are the deals, not even necessarily at MIT, but let's say over the last six months that you've seen being done um, that you think will actually make a difference to the culture? And I'm going to ask you to keep your answers reasonably pithy because we're running out of time. Um, well, I think we mentioned this actually in the rehearsal, but I'll jump in and say this one. It's the, um, the Facebook Spotify thing. I thought that was a pretty interesting thing. You know, if it, is anybody a Spotify user? Or, yeah. Okay, so you know what Spotify is, and it's you know it's a great service. And then they go to the states, and of course in F8 when Zuckerberg gets up, and of course he brings then he brings out you know Daniel and says, oh by the way, <laughs> we're working together now. Oh, and y it, you can't get a Spotify account unless you have a Facebook account. Ooh, interesting. So uh, th that was an interesting deal to me. It was great for Daniel in one sense because of course he's got access to all these bloody Facebook people. But on the other hand, it's sort of you know who's running the who's running the show. So I, I thought that was an interesting deal, but also a slight scary deal. At uh, MIP Junior on Saturday, uh, for instance, we heard Fremantle talk about how the formerly so scorned term user-generated content is back on the agenda, which is nice, I think. Uh, but in another context than just people uploading funny YouTube videos or not so funny YouTube <laughs> videos. And also Anne Sweeney uh, the Dis uh, from Disney. It was, it's more of like the changes that happens inside big companies now rather than I think uh, 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 one specific deal. Everyone is going in the same direction and just basically acknowledging that the world is at a social place and we need to go there as well. Uh, and the other important deals I can't tell you about because I'm under an NDA, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, just, that's just cheeky. Transparency, does anyone know what that deal is? Tweet it now. <laughs> James. Um, I, I, I'd say it's not so much a deal as lack of deal. I, I'm still, we were expecting a lot from um, YouTube's panel and it's their presentation actually. They What they're doing in terms of the, the playbook, which is fantastic, the, the, they showed some amazing figures. They said we've got three, three billion views a, a day or something huge. Um, but we've still yet to see them do a proper deal with, with content providers and for people to really content producers really start making money off YouTube beyond uh, what they can get from the advertising, which is relatively small, um, depending on their size, of course. So I'm hoping to see more from them in terms of really working with the with the with with TV producers because for now it's a fantastic platform. Um, but I, I wonder when they'll start buying, I mean, sort of really uh, content like Netflix are doing right now. Yeah, I mean, there was a, in the panel this morning that there was a sort of, su I thought, surprising consensus, which was the world is, you know, the middle is the probably the most dangerous place to be now. Yep. So, you know, there's the big stuff, the massive stuff, the, the enormous stuff, and then there's the small niche stuff that you do and you might possibly do it for your own satisfaction and for your own self-expression and for your own peer group and stuff. But, you know, the middle ground, you know, the average, you know, the... the, the, the the schedule filling average is is probably like the most dangerous place to be. Mm. So you know, when we look forward, do you think that you know the on-demand age is going to be you know one in which really favours the idiosyncratic, the Ardman animations <laughs> of this world, the people with a with a unique point of view? You know, do you think that's going to really enable people, or do you think this is going to be the age of the mighty, you know, the mighty corporations and everyone else basically vanity publishing online? What do you think, Kate? What's your? I, I just hope it's not uh, what you said. Me too. Uh, yeah. B. I mean, if it's B, I mean, we might as well just. I mean, it just makes you want to slit your throat. Um, the. I mean, I. 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 Okay. I. I live and work in the UK. In the UK, we have this terms of trade thing, which is great for I independent producers. If you're not familiar with it, look it up. You can Google it. But basically, what it is is it says it. It, it protects the small guys so they can have some of the rights, the you know, the secondary rights, so they can keep going and actually make a living. And that's really important for the ecology of content creation in the UK. And of course, as we've seen, the creation of content in the UK gets exported big time because it's just so wonderful. If we get rid of that, then the whole thing falls apart. That's one thing that's holding it together in the UK. 
as we get into these more disaggregated models that you're talking about, you know, what is going to be there that's going to make sure that that, that the little guys can grow up to be at least middling sized guys to produce the kind of stuff that we need, as you say, to fill the schedules around the world. So it's not just the big lumbering giants that yeah. are doing just the big live, you know, yeah. singing shows or whatever, which is great. I'm not saying they're bad, but we don't need a, the, everything. No. It shouldn't be that. So it's like, how do we, how do we make sure that we have the other stuff? And I don't, I don't really have an answer to that. I think it's got to be, as I've said before, I think it's got to be you get more revenue from different sources, you have much more you patch together revenue, all that kind of stuff. But it's, I think it's a bit of a scary time. And I think the big beast that we've been sort of talking about, you know, be they Facebook, YouTube, you mentioned, you know, these are big companies that are becoming the big distribution platforms. You know, they, if, if they don't come on board and start being getting involved in sort of the money behind this, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. But it's almost as if because they came from startups that took over the world, they're like, well, if you want to get something going, start something. And, you know, yeah. we did, we did, you know, we, we, did, did, we did our bit. We made the tool. <laughs> you go and figure it out. And <laughs> we made the tool. You know, it's up to and, you guys. And certainly, you know, going into yeah. those companies and sort of saying, you know, here's my idea. And they go, we love that idea. And, and you're like, so? And they say, well, you know. As soon as you've got it made, we'll definitely help you find people to watch yeah. it. And you're like, yeah, but... Yeah, we'll put know. content idea against it so you can get some advertising I revenue. Mean, you, you were sort of going, hmm, maybe I don't mind a world where the world is full of you know, amateurs making my favourite squirrel video. It, 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 it <laughs> yeah, it's it depends, great. But there are very, many, very fine squirrel videos. Yes, don't, exactly. don't bash them. <laughs> I but I, I think we're going to see a lot of boutique things, as you were saying, being snapped up by big ones because they're I over the next couple of years. I think we're going to see, there was this crowdfunding session that I missed out on, but I absolutely believe that crowdfunding is a way not to get thing, things produced because you never get really enough money in to do anything, but you get the traction for it, you get the fan base going, you get a reason to talk about what you are creating, and you uh, get a reason to put down what you are trying to make in a way that makes sense to someone, it's like preparing for coming to MIPCOM and pitch people, yeah. Which is a good thing for any project and helps it become much better. It also might give you some money to at least get the pilot done. Uh, and certainly. then you can yes. maybe but sell it to yes. somebody yes. bigger and certainly. get some more money. But yes. the message of the panel was that crowdfunding isn't so much about the money, it's about the, the as you said, the traction, the engagement, the activating your fan base to, to really help you out. I mean, if you read the YouTube Creator Playbook, which I've had the deep pleasure of doing, it is actually an amazing thing. You should go and find it. It's really interesting. What really comes across, though, and someone said, the person who sent it to me, s who had worked at the company that created it before it was bought by YouTube, said, you know, our contention or our, our ambition was to create a how-to book that meant that even if you just put a video up of a guy picking his nose, you'd have a, you'd have a hit channel. So... And, and, and I was speaking to a guy from Indiegogo where I said, you know, what are the most popular crowdfunded shows that you do? And he said, well, it's not. It's people ask me that all the time. And, you know, is it starving children? Is it injured pets? Is it... He said, actually, one of the most successful campaigns we had was a guy that broke his tooth on Sunday and on Monday morning asked the community to fund his root canal. And... Um, and had to shut the campaign because he was overfunded. And he said, and the reason why he was overfunded was he put regular video updates, he was in constant contact with that community, he was absolutely there for it. And exactly. certainly if you read the U YouTube Creator Playbook, okay, at the beginning they say, you know, the really important thing here is excellence, quality, blah, blah, blah. But actually the next 100 pages are about how do you connect your content to the network of networks in such a way that just purely the way the network functions yeah. brings you, just na just brings you people. So it's not, you know, it's back to the picking your nose analogy, mm -hmm. you know, and actually do what they say in the book and you will get traffic. It's like using the network. Yeah, mm -hmm. because the network just has a certain kind of robotic functionality to it that it's just you need to understand, you know. It's, it's sometimes it's a bit too easy to say this is what's happening in music, It'll, it might happen in TV, but um, what is happening in music right now is the this trend of um, DIY artists or, or what you call director fans. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether, whether artists have a label or not, thanks to social media, they can reach their fans directly and I don't think there's any reason that should be different for TV or documentary or, or film producers at all because they've got all these fantastic free tools that's an advantage of youtube they don't pay you but you don't pay them either um and you so you've got all access to all these people you can show them you're picking your nose and 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 if you do it properly 
in HD. <laughs> Um, this is really going too far. Guys. They were, they <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about cats on skateboards again. It's better. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the point is, is is really important. So maybe what we're going towards is majors doing their thing and then uh, independent producers doing doing their thing directly uh, with or without channels. I mean, like the, like the networks, why do they need them? Any questions? We have a couple of minutes. Or any observations, or observations that we've missed, Indeed. maybe. Okay, well, Other with themes. one minute and 18 seconds to go, I'd like to thank my panel very, very much oh, for yeah, coming. Oh, we got one! <laughs> a late entrance. Hold on, there's a microphone coming. Here we go. Change of subject. In general, have you noticed any impact on MIPCOM of the economic situations in Europe, the US? I've got the general impression that the, the the attitude was basically a recession. What recession? Have you noticed any sort of impact? Well, you got to keep in mind the headline figures. I mean, TV viewing is up around the world. Um, advertising's come back from 2008 and 9 when it just went, you know, tanked. So it's come back to at least that level and a little bit above. I mean, PwC was here in force this week, and they were put out all kinds of numbers that say things are actually moving up a little bit. So, so the the. It's, you know, yes, there is a recession. We've got lots of problems going on economically, but, you know, television, you know, is still relatively robust, certainly from where it was from the advertising perspective a couple of years ago, if that's what you mean. In terms of the actual impact on this market, it's been a huge impact on this market. This one's better than the one, the one in May, but, you know, a lot of people are sending a lot less people. April. The stands are smaller. You know, people are being more selective about what they're doing. If you look at, at individual productions, you know, chime in here, guys. But if you t individual productions, you know, there's a lot less money floating around. They're having to patch together deals. So it's a lot harder to get the funding for something. It takes a lot longer to get something commissioned. It takes a lot longer to get something sold. So these are all things that have definitely impacted the market. But don't worry, the gloom will be back come April. That's right. <laughs> yeah, when the U.S. implodes, yeah. Well, that's you know that's one of the economies is you know it's going to be running things you know it's g not going to be the U.S. and the U.K. It's going to be India and Indonesia and China. And yeah, I'm pretty sure TV we had more does well in a recession because people aren't going out. You know, Hollywood was born in the 30s. You know, I mean, really. So you know, sitting on your bum and watching is cheaper than going out and eating in restaurants and shopping and. You know. The only the only thing I'd say about that is you know we had what was it about I don't know nine or ten months ago we started hearing about cord cutting everybody knows what that is right you know, people turn off their pay TV subscription and you know everybody said oh the cab the cable guys in the states said oh it's really not happening don't worry it's not happening and of course then Netflix started getting more and more you know let's say feet or leverage or motion and then people started seeing their pay packets go down and guess what. Now cord cutting is about 10, 15 percent, I think, in the U.S. market. I mean, Comcast reported less subs. So yes, it's recession-proof in some senses, but I think people are also making, let's say, discretionary choices about how much money they're actually going to spend on their, quote, TV, yeah? And it may be that they get rid of their super-duper all-in subscription to Comcast or Virgin Media or Sky or whatever it is, and they say, maybe I can make do with a streaming model from Netflix for 10 bucks a month. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Very good. Safe Thanks. journey home. Bye-bye. And thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Thank you.